the um, monetary happen? All right, well, thanks to everybody for coming. My name's Greg Gallant, I'm here from New York. I run a company called Sawhorse Media, and uh, one of our products is Muckrack. They gave me the liberty of choosing the name for this, uh, this panel, so I figured uh, kind of chronicle how Twitter, Facebook, and our site Muckrack have changed journalism. So uh, I'm gonna dig right into this. Uh, as we go along, I think um, it's a, it's a small enough room that if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to shout them out, and otherwise I'm gonna leave plenty of time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna go through both our story in starting this company, the state of journalism on social media. Uh, then I'm gonna do a walkthrough of how Muckrack works for any of you that are interested, and then I'm gonna kind of wrap it up looking big picture what journalists should do on social media, and also what journalists shouldn't do on social media. And now before I get to my next slide, um, I'm gonna, kind of my story starts back early with Twitter. Does anyone in here know what color Twitter's first logo was? What color? So we have black, any, green, very good, who said that? So this, this is what Twitter looked like when it first came out in 2006. Tagline was, use Twitter, they couldn't afford the vowels yet. Use Twitter to stay in touch with your friends all the time. If you have a cell and can text, you'll never be bored again, ever. So this is how I uh, kind of first came to Twitter very early on. In fact, I signed up so early I was able to get my first name on Twitter, at Gregory. It was actually my second choice. I wanted at Greg, only at Gregory was open. And I thought Twitter was such a um, kind of quirky and not necessarily valuable service that I didn't want to upload my real photo. So I uploaded this photo of uh, what's called the Big Duck out in Long Island, New York which is like a roadside uh, store shaped like a duck. And to remind myself that I didn't see it coming, I never changed my avatar since. But I saw um, early on, this was like in 2008, that people were creating good content on Twitter, content that other people, not, not just their friends, would want to follow. And yet it was really hard to figure out who should you follow on Twitter so if you're interested in news or sports or politics, who are the top people to follow on Twitter? So to solve that, the, uh, the first thing my company created was the Shorty Awards, which is the award ceremony originally for best of just Twitter, now it's the awards for best of all social media. And we kind of invented this system where you could vote on Twitter by simply kind of tweeting out I endorse, I put in here, at A. Carvin, he won the Journalism Shorty Award two years ago for a shorty category and pound, whatever. And then we would crowdsource this so our site would automatically suck in all of these nomination tweets and then uh, create a real-time leaderboard out of it. So we launched this in late 2008, thinking it would be kind of just a joke. We thought maybe the award ceremony would be like half the size of this room. And uh, within 24 hours of launch, it became the top trending term on Twitter. And from there, it just kept, uh, kept growing and growing. I have here um, about a two minute video from the Shorty Awards that shows how big it's gotten in the last year. And, uh, and then after that, I'll explain how the Shorty Awards led to Muckrack and kind of brought us in early back in 2009 to this whole world of uh, journalism and Twitter. It's an award like an Oscar or um, a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, better, probably.
I'll speak from the heart. Today, I'm very honored to be here. Honoring the best and brightest in social media. The best creators on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Foursquare, and YouTube. People who have been able to do tweets gives them the recognition they deserve. Hashtag Shorty Award. Congratulations to all the winners. Congratulations to the Shorty Award winner. Yes, I, I have a 140 character speech. I like some Tumblr. Make sure you get to the shortyawards.com. Thank you, Shorty Awards. I would give that an award. This is very cool. I'm so excited. I cannot accept it alone. I share this Shorty with so many people, most especially the children who help make it possible. Hey guys, Jimmy Kimmel won the Lifetime Achievement Shorty Award. What? Yeah, Lifetime Achievement. What the heck? Hey honey, you know the Shorty Awards? Yeah. Jimmy Kimmel just won one. What? Thank you for the Shorty Award. The Shorty Awards are underway. In the NYC tonight, the Wanted is up for best band at the Shorty Awards. Basically, um, the online awards for the best of social media. So this is not your typical awards show. This isn't Hollywood patting themselves on the back. These are people that could be anybody, right? Why do you think you deserve a Shorty Award? America's best social media users earn Shorty Awards each year. But social media's Night of Nights is still to come. The fifth annual Shorty Awards. You know, people that indulge in narcissistic behavior of talking out into the internet need to be acknowledged for that. So anyhow, that's the uh, that's the Shorty Awards in a nutshell, and uh, these these have been kind of going on. Now we just had our fifth annual. Tim Pool won our Journalist Shorty Award, but it was actually back when we started the Shorty Awards in uh, 2008 that we saw that uh, journalists were on Twitter much more than anybody else. And it was, um, you know, it's just hard, hard to appreciate now how even though Twitter is so small, we saw that we got all this coverage uh, with the Shorty Awards and back when we had the first annual, we had a press room set up for journalists. We, uh, we set it up for 20 journalists. We ended up having 60 show up. So we learned that journalists, and we also ran out of uh, drinks for them, so we learned that journalists like to drink and they like to tweet. And so that led us to create Muckrack, which was the first ever site to kind of just pull together and list all the journalists on Twitter based on uh, what publication they worked at. And the idea was that people were questioning the value of Twitter in general. They were saying, you know, how do you know it's all user-generated content? How do you know if any of this is real? So with Muckrack, we basically broke it out and said, hey, well, if you trust you know, what the New York Times or what the BBC says in print, why not trust what they also have, what all their journalists have to say on Twitter? So this was the first coverage we ever got from Peter Kafka at Wall Street Journal's All Things D. Want to watch the media, media hug Twitter in real time? This is the site for you. And uh, since 2009, we started with uh, 150 journalists, which was a pretty good sampling of all the journalists on Twitter. We've since grown it now, so we're up to over 15,000 journalists that we have on Muckrack. And we recently, um, in December of last year, did this analysis of all the journalists uh, on Twitter that we verified, the over 15,000, with Sri Saravashan, who's the uh, Columbia Journalism School professor and chief digital officer there, and also a guest columnist for CNET, where we kind of broke out to see, you know, which journalists are using it the most, which have the most followers, and uh, which publications have the most journalists on there. So this was the, the top 10 most followed journalists, leading off with Anderson Cooper, who has three and a half million followers. And of course, you know, followers isn't what everything's about, but it's always a crude metric just to kind of get a sense of who's where. Then we also, um, more interestingly, figured out which publications have the most journalists on Twitter, uh, according to our uh, directories. So the Associated Press has 471. So congrats to uh, Eric, who I know uh, is in the audience. New York Times has 463, and then you know, kind of goes on. Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Guardian, Reuters, USA Today, CNN, LA Times, and Sky News. And then uh, we also analyzed, if you add up all the people following all the journalists at each publication, 
which publication would have the most collective followers. So starting with CNN, so this 12, 12 million number isn't how many followers at CNN has, but it's the number where if you take every journalist at CNN and add up their following, that's where they fall in. And so again, and with the rest of my talk, the real focus is, is less about how the news organizations use Twitter and social media. It's all about how the journalists themselves use social media. And this is simply the aggregation. And finally, this was a recent study where it was asking journalists how they find sources. And just to kind of sum up, you know, that we're already at a point where more than half of journalists are using social media to find sources. And from going to many of the other um, events this, uh, this weekend, I think it's obvious that, you know, it's just something now that is, you know, simply part of the news gathering process. So let me, uh, let me jump out of here and I'm going to give you a walkthrough of how Muckrack works and then I'll kind of jump back into the bigger ideas. Basically with Muckrack, the idea is it's a way to see easily with one dashboard what journalists are uh, talking about, tweeting about, etc. So when you first log in, this is what you see, this newsroom view. And it shows you what stories are being most tweeted about by journalists right now. So you can see it's this, currently this Boston Globe story by Eric Markowitz, basically recounting what happened to the uh, carjacking victim during the Boston uh, bombings. And then in addition to just the tweet, it tells you how much it's shared on both Facebook and Twitter. And then it shows you what journalists are saying about that story. And any journalists who you see appear on these pages of Muckrack are journalists who've been vetted by our team of editors. So you know that they're actually, you know, whichever, um, they're actually who they say they are, similar to like the very small subset that Twitter verifies. And in addition, we tell you their title and publication. So you can not only get these reactions, but you can see, hey, here's what somebody from the Associated Press is saying about this article. Here's what someone from the New York Times is saying about it. LA Times and then uh, 350 more tweets from, from only journalists about this one story. So it's an easy way where if you want to see if you're a journalist what all your colleagues are thinking about right now, talking about right now, linking to right now, that's what you kind of get with this homepage of Muckrack. And then it's also a really good way where if you want to see what other media outlets are talking about right now, you can just go through and find any, uh, any publications. So let's say we want BBC. We can pop through and this will show us who are the most followed journalists at the BBC. Starting with uh, Robert Preston, their business editor. You can kind of scroll through this carousel to see more. It'll also show you which um, which stories at the BBC are uh, most tweeted about by other journalists and what they're saying. So you might want to find your own publication on here and then see, you know, what are other journalists from all publications saying about our stories. You can get a complete listing of all the journalists at the BBC. And then you can also break it down by beat. So we could say, just show me the, uh, the science journalists at the BBC and get straight down to that group. You can also figure out, uh, see more of the stories that BBC and then see collectively what are they all tweeting. And then uh, in addition, you can also use our advanced search tool and this will let you search through every single tweet from every single journalist for the past six plus months. And then we also index the full text of everything that they link to. So let's just try doing a uh, International Journalism Festival. We want to see what people are saying about here. And you can see we can also sort it to just journalists who cover a given beat or from a given outlet. But I'll just do the most general search I can to start. And you'll see first thing we come up with is the co-founder very appropriately. But, but let's switch to most recent. And so here you can see that we have Michael Turpin, uh, the publisher of the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And you can see it's an interesting result because he didn't mention International Journalism Festival in his tweet, but he linked to this story 
And in the story, it mentions International Journalism Festival. So we built this as kind of a tool. You can see Anthony DeRosa, um, what more and more other journalists are talking about it. So it's a tool if you want to find colleagues who are also covering a given story. You can even set a, uh, an email alert based on this term so you can get emailed. And the, the whole idea is just to make sure that your colleagues don't scoop you or if they're on the verge of scooping you, maybe you'll be the, uh, the first to know because they're searching all the uh, content they're sharing. And then finally, I'll just show you our, uh, our profile building tool where for any journalist, they can create a profile on Muckrack where it links to all their, uh, all their various social media profiles elsewhere. So here's Andy Carvin, his Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Foursquare, you know, Flickr, et cetera, et cetera. You can see he lists out what he covers, awards that he won, and lists his Shorty Award first very appropriately in addition to other awards and portfolio pieces. I'll also show you uh, Fiona Graham of BBC who's filled out an interesting profile where she also fills out more of what she covers. So she's kind of inviting sources to get in touch with her if they're interested in those topics. And then almost more interestingly, she writes what I don't cover. So it's a way to tell people stop pitching me on all these terms. And she has uh, funding rounds no pre-written viewpoint pieces. We don't run stuff that could run elsewhere. She doesn't cover any financials unless there's a good related hook and company results. So it's a way of, um, you know, that she's using it to kind of limit what's going down. And then people can also contact her through Muckrack. So people could then send her a pitch to write about, you know, one of these topics, but it limits the pitch to just 300 characters. So the idea is it kind of forces brevity and makes life easier for journalists. But in addition, the journalists can use this as a way to kind of promote their career along the rest of uh, what they might do with social media. So you can see that she uploaded her portfolio of uh, some of the best work that she's done. It also pulls in how much each item she's written has been shared. And this is also uh, especially good for freelancers where you might have stories, you know, mixed between lots of different, um, lots of different outlets. So this is a way to, um, to kind of pull them all into one place and, uh, and, and show off um, what you've done. Then you can also just keep a full bio here and it also has this interview that you can fill out to go into more depth about how you use uh, social media. So here's the answer is, have you ever used a typewriter? Yes, but not very well. And so, th so that's Muckrack in a nutshell. The idea with all of it is to, to kind of help, help you see kind of what's going on in the world of journalism. So I can skip through a few slides now that I prepared in case the internet went out, which I've heard is unheard of here. And so now what should journalists do on social media? Uh, of course, there are many things, and I'm sure you'll hear that elsewhere, but I've zeroed in on four. Cover their beats, be present on many platforms, find sources, and track metrics. Now, journalists uh, already, you know, most are on social media all the time looking for news, scoops, and sources. So I think it's, you know, if not already, fast becoming a requirement for journalists, not only to be on Twitter, but to use it well, and then other social media platforms too, which I'll talk about. Uh, so I'll start out with a case study. This is two sworn enemies, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, uh, focusing on both their media writers, Keith Hagee and Brian Stelter. And this is a, a tweet sent out one day a few months ago at 4.51 p.m. It's important to pay attention to the times in this, where she's kind of toying with her, uh, her frenemy, her rival, uh, Brian Stelter, who often tweets, stand by for news. So she's writing to channel Brian Stelter, stand by for news. One minute later, Brian Stelter retweets her. Two minutes later, Brian Stelter scoops her story where he finds a story that she was about to break before she got a chance to breaking it about Keith Olbermann uh, leaving current TV. 
And then 5.04, just about 20 minutes after that, another journalist is starting to realize what will happen. Today's moral, invoke at Brian Stelter's name and he will scoop your story. That's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. And then finally, about an hour after this scoop, Keith Olbermann actually announces the news that they, uh, that they had already scooped. And then, of course, 10 minutes after that, BuzzFeed has a slideshow explaining this whole uh, incident with Brian Stelter's coldest retweet ever. And so, you know, kind of shows you just this kind of an extreme example, but the degree to which news is playing out on social media, and it's often, you know, again, not the media company's Twitter accounts that's are that's interesting, but the actual accounts of the journalists. And now the question is like, you know, every, everyone, I think we kind of take, we're starting to take Twitter for granted, but what about all the other social media platforms? What should journalists do on them? So let's start with Facebook, where, you know, Facebook is such an interesting thing, where on one hand, it's much larger than Twitter, much more global, but at the same time, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot younger and not as well used among journalists professionally because it's traditionally just been something you use to connect with your friends. Whereas more and more they're trying to uh, compete with Twitter and be a place that journalists want to be on to break news. So, uh, you know, one thing if anyone hasn't already, you can turn on Facebook subscribe where simply if you go to facebook.com slash subscribe, I'm sure there's some Italian uh, equivalent to that URL, you can let anybody follow your updates even if they're not your friend. And then when you start posting updates from now on, you can choose if it's something that goes out to everybody or to just your friends. And of course, that's um, pretty much makes it a lot more like Twitter. And I've seen, you know, more and more journalists are starting to do this, and it's good to do it sooner than later, just because with all these platforms, the sooner you are in doing something, the more influence you can gain. And then uh, also, of course, you know, there, there's this Facebook Plus journalist group that's worth joining where they kind of advocate using various different methods. And then I'm sure most journalists in this room have already used Facebook to find sources just because everyone's on Facebook so it's easy to search for anybody. And the stronger and kind of more relatable presence you have on Facebook, the more apt people will be to respond to you. Now with, uh, this, this is Quora. I don't know how many of you guys already know Quora. I imagine it's also a more text heavy site, so I don't know how well it's translated. But it's basically a question and answer site founded by one of the former Facebook executives. And I just pulled in this Pointer uh, article that talks about ways journalists can use Quora. What's interesting about Quora is that it's an kind of in-depth Q&A site and they've done a lot to enable people who answer questions to establish their credibility. So, you know, if there's a question on um, what does it feel like to be in a battle, you'll probably actually have soldiers answering that question and they can fill in why they're reliable and then other soldiers could vote them up. So it's just a great way to see like, hey, who actually knows about these various issues? And then again, you know, you can either contact them through Quora or it links out to the person's other social media profiles. And as a journalist, it's also just another great way to connect with readers and get your message out. So if you're a subject matter expert on a given beat, you can really kind of get yourself out there, answer questions on that beat, and kind of both build more credibility, but also set yourself up as a go-to person with potential sources in future. Now finally, Google+, Plus, which is this kind of, um, again, a very odd, underdog in the social media world where on the one hand there's nothing bigger than Google. I just went to the Google news panel yesterday where it was nothing but uh, journalists being very skeptical of Google News and what it's done to the news business. But yet Google Plus is this kind of, um, is their social network that they're struggling 
to get competitive with Twitter and Facebook. And I'm sure, uh, like most people, we've logged into Google once and then never again. So the the question is like, what? Where is Google Plus actually useful for journalists? And I'd say, uh, you know, of all the things, there's really two areas where Google Plus excels for journalists. One is Google Hangouts, which is this uh, free platform they have where you can host basically a video hangout with up to 10 people live. So it's kind of like a video Skype call, but the real gem of it is you can publish the, ha the hangout to YouTube with one click. So if you want to easily start making more video content, you could say, let's say find five people around the world who you want to talk to about an issue, pull them into this Google Hangout, ask them questions, and then at the end of it, publish it to YouTube with one click. And very interestingly, I don't know if any of you have watched Huffington Post Live, but Huffington Post several months ago launched a um, kind of the idea is like their, their own version of CNN, like a 24 hour, although it's actually a 12 hour, live news show and they heavily use Google Plus to pull people in so they have their own studio but then they they're always pulling in various influencers from around the world to talk about whatever issues and they just power it all for free using Google Plus. And then the second thing about Google Plus of course is that they've integrated with Google News so love it or hate it you're going to start appeal appearing in Google News so if you're Robert Williams and you just revealed one of the three men who were uh, too sexy for Saudi Arabia following up on the story where Saudi Arabia deported uh, people for supposedly being too sexy. Um, he actually gets his, his byline in the Google News results because he set up a Google Plus profile and because the independent did the necessary steps to help him be identified. So, you know, both your news organization has to set up the right tags for Google Plus but if you have that profile, it can be a very advantageous way to get more people to check out your article. And now I want to talk about the, the metrics that, that have been made possible by social media. So we all know you, know, you can compare Twitter followers like uh, I did before, but uh, especially for journalists, com Twitter followers is one of the least relevant metrics. I think you know, the metric that matters more that, that we all want to know is you write a story how many people read it. And we're at this kind of unprecedented time where, you know, any time before in history, there was no way to know how many people read your article or competitors' articles. So, of course, before the internet, we had no idea, right? You got a paper newspaper, and who knows how many people opened to page 10 where your story was. And even in the uh, kind of first wave of the internet, there was no way to know because most uh, publications wouldn't share the analytics with the journalists. So if you were a journalist that, let's say, you know, the New York Times, the New York Times will know how many people view your story, but they're not going to let you see that as a journalist. And then more importantly, you can't, you can't see how many views competitive stories have received because, uh, you know, most media companies won't release metrics on a given story and you know whenever these media companies do release metrics they always kind of fib and manipulate the numbers to make them as high as possible so you've never seen a media company release you know bad metrics on how uh, how their company's doing but now with social media the cat's out of the bag you can view how many shares any story's gotten be it a story you wrote or a story a competitor's written and so I'm going to talk about how to do that, but I think you just can't underemphasize how important it is both to see, you know, how much of the stuff you're sharing works and then also to analyze like with competitors and uh, other publications, like which of their stories are going viral and which aren't. So now some publications give you, um, give you share counts. So if you look at like Mashable, they, they have, um, you know, up on top there, how many, if you can take your eyes off Beyonce for a moment, how many shares on each social platform this article's had, and then they even add it up for you. Uh, same with BuzzFeed. Here's their articles, uh, 35 ways you are a young 
George Costanza, of course, animated GIF included. And it gives you how much this article was shared on each platform. They don't add it up, but you can see it has 2,000 Facebook shares, 5,000 Facebook likes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now the question is, what if you work at a publication that doesn't have these share buttons on there or where the, uh, where the publication um, you know, doesn't add it up elegantly? So you could always find out these numbers. They're all public, even though they embedded it. They're, they're publicly out there. You could go to Twitter or Facebook directly and simply ping their API and get those numbers back. Uh, but we also built our own tool to do it. So I'll show you. This is an article I wrote for Fortune a few months ago. And I grabbed the URL. And then I'm pasting it into, this is a tool we built with Muckrack. You can get to it at whosharedmylink.com and I'll redirect to this page, and simply plug in the URL, and it tells you how much it's been shared on each social media platform, and then how many shares it got total. So it's a very easy way to just add up how many shares has, have, have, has any URL on the internet, be it an article I wrote or an article somebody else wrote, has gotten. And then it's also a um, you know, great number to have if you're about to ask for a raise from your boss or look for a new job to be able to point out how many people are sharing your past articles. And then uh, I'm wrapping up here, but I figured, you know, if we're talking about what journalists should do on social media, what should journalists not do? Uh, first thing is don't get fished, don't get fired, don't use long disclaimers, and don't run out of batteries. So starting with the top, this was actually something I had in here before the incident with uh, AP getting fished, but it was really interesting with Muckrack because we follow all the journalists. We will see, um, you know, every week there are dozens of journalists that get fished, and fishing means somebody um, kind of fools you into giving you the pa your password to your account. And... Um, is kind of particularly pertinent for journalists because, you know, if you're direct messaging with sources, all of that is stored on your Twitter account. So if you get fished, potentially whoever gets that, gets access to your account can reveal your sources, not to mention publish misinformation under your account, which is trusted. So usually what they'll do is they'll send you an email saying, hey, this is Twitter, please log in, please reset your password. And then you'll get directed to a site that looks like Twitter, but isn't really Twitter. And then when you enter your password, you're really giving it to, um, to this hacker who will then log into your account. So here you can see um, when you go to a login screen, you should see HTTPS showing the secure server and that it's the URL of, that it should be. So Twitter.com for Twitter, Facebook.com for Facebook. And then usually what fishers will do, as you can see um, in, in this area over here, is they'll, they'll do some variant of the URL that looks legit, like here you see it's twitter.secure-login.com. And all that means is someone went to GoDaddy, bought secure-login.com, and then set up this URL, put in a design that looks like Twitter, and is set up to fool you. So, um, so it's just something to be extra careful about as a journalist to make sure that whenever you give your credentials that you're on the secure server of the site that you should be on. Uh, another thing is, um, I blocked out this reporter's name, but of course, you know, lots of people are starting to write in their Twitter bio, tweets and retweets are not endorsements or other, other disclaimers like that. And so, you know, views are not my own, et cetera, et cetera. So now, uh, a lot of people of the mind, actually myself included, that it's, it's really probably not necessary to include a disclaimer at all in your Twitter bio because, you know, of course, you know, not everything you retweet's an endorsement and, and, you know, but to some degree also, right, if you tweet a link to something, you are lending uh, some, some level of credibility to it. So I, I feel like the disclaimers are in a tricky place no matter what. But we figured for people who did feel it was necessary to use one of these disclaimers, we built the world's first 
disclaimer shortener. So here's another journalist out there, WBEZ's business reporter. And you can see in, in her Twitter bio, she just put in cdisclaimer.com and saving, you know, about 20 characters compared to the last Twitter bio that I showed you. And then if you go to that URL, it redirects you to our service, Disclaimify. And it just tells you all the stuff that people would otherwise have to write into their disclaimer. And uh, just, again, you know, trying to, doing the little things to make, uh, make journalists' live more, lives more easy. And then the final tip that I listed there was, uh, you know, mo most of social media, I think I saw um, Eric say uh, in another, Eric Carvin, who's here in, in another panel on Twitter, that, you know, social media is all about, you know, using your phone, which is all it comes down to. But of course, in an event like this, it's very easy to um, drain your battery and then you're out of business when it comes to social media. So, you know, it's hard to stress enough that it's just great to buy. This is a uh, $30 battery you can plug any USB cord into and it gives you two and a half charges. This is another one that I just got where it's actually got the, um, the plug built into it. You plug it straight into the wall and then it's got two USB connectors at the bottom that you can plug your phone into that you can either use to charge or when you're done charging, just turn on the, uh, turn on the battery itself and power it off of that. So that's my, uh, my final quick social media tip. But with that, um, that kind of brings me through the end of my presentation. And you know, I'd love to take your questions or any thoughts that you have both on uh, kind of social media in general with journalists or anything specific with Muckrack. Oh, sorry, uh, let's wait for the mic, I didn't realize. Hi, uh, what's your opinion on Google authoring uh, Google Plus uh, for journalists uh, byline? Uh, what do you believe uh, about future influence of that, uh, of the thing that is Google putting out? Will it uh, give more credit to the stories that, to the authors that are uh, engaged in Google Plus? Yeah, so I think you know, the thing, the thing to understand about Google is that, you know, Larry Page, their CEO, kind of determined that they need to have this kind of social infrastructure across all of Google. Google Plus is their bid for that, and they are, you know, hell-bent on making Google Plus work. So wherever they can leverage Google Plus, they will, and you know, the first manifestation in Google News that we've seen is that byline piece. So I think for journalists, love it or hate it, you should be on Google Plus because even right now you can see, you know, they're giving some priority to it. And my guess is like, Google's just wanna, gonna wanna do more. They're gonna wanna push people more and more onto Plus. So to the extent that, you know, you can show uh, you're their friend, they'll, you know, that they're gonna, keep in subtle ways making it more, uh, driving more traffic and, and featuring more the people who use their products than they will the people who are ignoring them. So I think, you know, with Google Plus, it's, it's something that um, journalists should just be on. Yeah. Hi, Greg, how's it going? <clears throat> I'm, I'm Eric Harvin. Uh, social media editor AP has mentioned me a couple of times for some reason. Um, so I had a question about Muckrack's, Muckrack's international presence. Uh, uh, what uh, are th is there a large proportion of, of of journalists outside of the in particular outside of the English speaking world who are on Muckrack, and is this something that you're pushing toward? And relatedly, is uh, is there an interest in expanding it to more social networks, possibly even ones that are more prominent overseas? Yeah, it's a great question. So in terms of uh, our international presence with Muckrack, we're currently, um, so anybody can create a profile on Muckrack and, and do what they will with it. So I'd encourage everybody, regardless of what language you speak or where you are in the world, to set up a Muckrack profile. Uh, in terms of our directory that we've kind of structured that's edited by our editors, it's global now and we have lots of journalists outside of the US, but it, 
but we only encompass journalists that are English speaking or do at least like 50% uh, English tweets and then you know, it could be 50% whatever their native uh, tongue is and it's not something that we, uh, that we want to have that way, it's just we're, uh, you know, we're still a small company and that's what we have resources for today. But we very quickly want to um, expand to not only being international with English uh, speakers, but internationals with every uh, native language, which is why I was so excited to come here and then even more pleased to hear they're translating this talk so that those of you uh, who don't speak English can hear me right now. But you know, that's one of the things that we really want to do over the next uh, six to 12 months is expand to non-English speakers. So you know, I'd encourage everybody here to make a, uh, make a profile and then if you have ideas for how we should adapt the site to different native languages, particularly um, you know, whatever your native language is, uh, I'd love to hear it and my email is greg at muckrack.com. So, or you can tweet me and uh, you know, I'd love to get more ideas because it's, it's one of our big areas of expansion right now. Uh, is Mark Rack used also by PRs, I can imagine, and uh, in which uh, dimension? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question too. Uh, is Mark Rack used by PRs and people looking to reach journalists? And it is, that's actually um, our revenue model is that we don't have any advertising on the site, but for you know, PR people or even entrepreneurs doing their own PR, they can use Muckrack to contact journalists, but we've kind of been very careful with that because the site's originally for journalists and the last thing that we want is for, uh, for this to be a site that gets journalists spammed because God knows their PR people are already sending enough pitches. So that's why we developed the tool that we did, uh, and I only showed you half of it, where first we limit all the pitches from PR people to 300 characters, so they're very easy to read, and they can only be sent one by one, because the biggest problem right now, it's not that you know, people are getting too many great customized pitches, it, it's that they're getting all this kind of mass spam. So with Muckrack, it forces it to be one-on-one, -on -one. and then if you're a journalist, when you get the pitch, you can reject it with one click. So in the email with the pitch that comes through our, our service, there's a button saying this is relevant, but I don't feel like covering it right now. This is irrelevant or this is spam. And then we take that data, kind of like when you, you know, rate something on, um, on Amazon, we take that data and then we can start to build up reputations of each PR person. So to discourage the bad ones and then encourage the good ones. Yeah, let's see, other questions? All right, well, we're, uh, we're almost wrapped up anyhow, so we can take a, uh, a few extra minutes if nothing, nobody has anything, and uh, happy to chat with people one-on-one. -on -one. I also wanted to point out that we have these uh, muckrack tip cards, which are not business cards, they're advice on every acronym you can use on Twitter, like RT, MT, HT, OH, LMK. So feel free to come up and grab one. They're both useful if, uh, you know, I imagine that by virtue of being here, most of you would probably know all these acronyms, but they're great to give to a boss or a family member who does not understand social media to encourage them to do more. So feel free to come up and grab one. And with that, thanks to everybody for coming out. Please stay in touch. I'm at Gregory on Twitter, greg at muckrack.com. So thanks again. <laughs>